Okay, everybody, welcome to another in our uh, ongoing series of webinars for uh, S6L platform, for the Unified platform. Uh, <clears throat> so today we are going to discuss, if I can quit coughing and, you know, chucking up all this stuff, uh, we are going to talk about <laughs> the Unified platform and an examination of all of the connection schemes for S6L. Now, this is a pretty dense uh, webinar. we got a lot to cover here. Uh, so hold on tight. This is going to be a little bit like drinking from a fire hose, probably, but uh, let's get it going here. We'll just jump right into it. So, of course, uh, when we're talking about Unified Platform, everything we're going to discuss today applies to all the products in the Unified Platform. Uh, you know, it's this big ecosystem of control surfaces, engines, and I.O. that we've built. Uh, so this applies to all of that kind of stuff. So uh, we're going to start off with the easy one. Uh, let's just take a look at the ancillary connections uh, for S6L. We'll get through these pretty quickly. We won't spend a lot of time here. It's not the sexiest discussion, so we'll just breeze right on through it. Uh, let's talk about video connection first. All right, so we have a uh, connection for two video monitors in an S6L system. Uh, the primary one, which is the video that's used for venue software operation, that's the screen you usually see off to the side of the console. Uh, that one requires an HDMI or DVD compatible display uh, with 1920 times or, or by 1080 resolution minimum. Okay, so you got to have pretty good resolution on that monitor. We also support USB touch monitor uh, there as well. If you want to hook up the USB portion of that monitor and use it as a touch screen, go right ahead. We actually encourage that. So <clears throat> the second uh, monitor output you would see is on the engine. Uh, and it's a VGA connection, and we would use this for doing a system restore. So this is really only used if you're going to completely restore the system into a, uh, you know, a, a completely new software build where you're going to build it from the ground up. Uh, you'll need to access the engine and the software via that monitor uh, and use a Windows trackball and keyboard that is attached directly to the engine to be able to do that. So one of the clever ways I've seen guys deal with this so they didn't have to carry around a second monitor is if you can still find it, uh, is to buy a monitor that supports both HDMI or DVD uh, or DVID and VGA. That way you can use that same monitor for either purpose as you need it. Most, most of the time, once you're out on shows and doing things with it, you know, you would not need to get to that VGA port. Uh, as I say, that is for a complete system restore. You would hopefully never have to do that on site. You would only be doing that in the shop when you're prepping, okay? But, but that's the case there. Uh, with regard to USB, we, uh, USB 3.0 is supported uh, with S6L. You have four USB ports on all the S6L control surfaces. You have two on the front, two on the rear. Uh, you also have four USB ports on all the E6, E6 engines, uh, two on the front, two on the rear, uh, as well as one USB secure port inside the back of your control surface. So if you wanted to put an iLock or anything back there and, and keep it secure where nobody could walk off with it, anything like that, you're welcome to do that. <clears throat> USB hubs are supported. Uh, what I usually recommend to people when I'm speaking to them about it is to try to make sure your iLock is always in, an, in a native port. You know, it's not in the hub. You're welcome to connect a keyboard, trackballs, uh, the USB uh, touch portion of your monitor. Any of that can come in through a hub uh, just fine. But I, I've had the best luck not ever using an iLock through a hub. That way you don't risk losing authorization on your plugins, etc. So just a little life hack, life tip there for you. Uh, let's move on. Let's see, what do we got next? We got MIDI connection, of course. Uh, we have one MIDI input and output uh, port located on the back of the S6L control surface. Uh, 16 channels of MIDI supported, of course. Uh, either of these ports can select or can deliver or accept MIDI timecode if it's plugged in appropriately there. So we do support MTC there. Uh, we also support LTC uh, with S6L, which is uh, linear timecode. Uh, it reads time code in either direction. You can be having time code go forward or backwards. It'll still read it, and it'll detect uh, the following frame rates, as you can see on the screen there. So 24, 25, 30 non-drop, and 30 drop frame. All right, so those are the supported uh, uh, frame rates there. Uh, let's see, what's next? It's going to be headphone. Okay, uh, one of the cool things we have on S6L is two fully independent headphone outputs on the surfaces. Uh, and this allows you to set up two discrete solo buses, all kinds of things like that. They each have their own volume control uh, and can be addressed separately in the software. You have foot switch inputs. There are two tip sleeve uh, foot switch inputs used in conjunction with events programming. So in this situation, 
where you could create a switch closure that uh, activates any one of a, a jillion events on the console. Uh, you would just direct the trigger to that foot switch and allow it to happen. Things You could do things like tap tempo, all kinds of things uh, with that foot switch. It's, we support no, normally open, normally closed, latching and non-latching switches in that configuration. All right, so it's just a quarter, pair of quarter inch jacks on the back of the console. Of course, if you guys are familiar with Legacy Venue, you know that we support GPI inputs and outputs. Uh, this is just the ability to accept a switch closure or send a switch closure. And it's kind of a multi-pin version of it. You can do it across a 24-pin D-sub. And again, it works really just beautifully in conjunction with our events programming. Uh, you program, program up an event and direct it toward one of these GPI inputs or outputs, and either something will happen outside the console or something will happen inside the console as a result of that switch closure, okay? So that, I believe, just about covers all the ancillary connections. Now we're going to get really into the meat of it. <clears throat> Let's talk about uh, ABB connection schemes, all right? So hopefully this will demystify some of this for you guys, and uh, you can use this as a good resource to just, you know, if you get lost or you have questions on it, you know, come back and check this if you want to do it. So, you know, in our systems, we actually have two rings that operate at the same time. There is a local ring that includes the control surface, and there is, uh, and of course that would be attached to an AVB card in the engine. And then there is a second AVB card in the engine that addresses the IO loop, all the stage racks, et cetera. They're kind of two separate worlds a little bit inside the same system. So the scheme to connect this all together, and it's just as simple as this, just follow this and you're gonna be golden if you can stay on top of it. A to B, B to A. That's your connection scheme whenever you're creating these redundant loops. Uh, even though it's very small in the print there, I'll kind of highlight it here. In that top uh, section up there that where it says S6L control surface network ports, the bottom two connectors are A and B. The top two connectors are C and D. Obviously, you would never, well, maybe not obviously, but I will say to you, you will never integrate C and D ports with an A and B port loop. Okay, so those two, those two stay separately. So let's talk about how to create the console loop first. All right, so we're going to, that top uh, diagram or that top graphic represents the console the and we're going to create a loop to the engine here so we would go simply from a to b and then from b to a and now we've created the console loop now the console and its io everything is available uh, in to the engine we also have as you might know we have uh, additional io that we can expand a control surface io uh, a local 16 could be put in place. That would be just integrated into this loop uh, to, to do the same thing. So once again, A to B, A to B, and then A to B, right? So you just create it in the loop. Now you have that discrete network uh, happening right there for the con control surface and its local I.O. With regard to the C and D ports, these are reserved for uh, AVB recording. So just a simple Cat5 connection from the C port to a network port on a Macintosh, and you are ready to go 128 tracks backwards and forwards. And if you need a redundant version of that, you just put it on the D port, right? We just hook up a second computer and attach them there. Now, there's no um, imp uh, there's no implied sync between these two machines at all. You can set up a synchronized start and record of those two machines using you know a MIDI machine control, something like that. But there is no inherent synchronization between these two machines. They're, they're just running freely. They're just a redundant version of it. However, they do both capture, uh, you know, venue link protocols, et cetera, for snapshots, et cetera. Okay, but this is the connection scheme for it. Now, let's talk about connecting your stage racks to that second uh, AVB card in the engine. Well, same protocol is in place. If I want to create uh, and attach a stage 64, it's just from uh, connector A to connector B, and then connector A to connector, connector B. And once we're there, that is your redundant ring for the, your I.O. loop, for your I.O. network. Now, if we want to integrate other parts and pieces, uh, other I.O. devices into that loop, it's just a matter of daisy chaining them in, right? And remember here, I, you know, notice I show a stage 64 as well as a 32 and a 16. Right in the current version of software, we do not support the the use of stage 64, stage 32, and stage 16. It's either a set of stage 16s or stage 32s. You can't integrate those two yet. Okay. So currently, if you were going to do it, you would just 
daisy chain them together. So it's either the stage 32 or this, the ring of stage 60, uh, stage 16 there, excuse me. All right. But as you can see, the loop protocol stays in play there. A to B, B to A, all the way down through the, the thing. All right. So if you notice here, um, we do have multiple formats here. We have uh, B and C, and we also have fiber optic. And you can use either or, or you can mix them, mix them and match them as needed with certain rules in place, okay, and which we'll talk about here. So if I was going to integrate fiber, maybe this is a console sitting in front of the house, and for our long haul to the stage rack area, we're going to use fiber, but we're going to interconnect the other stage racks that are at that location with B and C. Uh, that's totally, or I mean with uh, CAP5, excuse me, that's totally okay to do. So the way we would do that is you would take the long haul on the A port fiber, up to the B port fiber on the stage rack. And then from there, you would go A to B again uh, with regular cat five and then return fiber back to the B port, right? So there you have your long haul on fiber, uh, your local interconnect on cat five. Okay, so it works just fine. So these are kind of the rules for this. Uh, this is a good visual representation of it that I pulled out of the manual. So <clears throat> in this situation, you just gotta remember you can't mix cable topologies on the same port, right? You can't have a, uh, a copper uh, Cat5 attached to the same port as a fiber optic connection, right? They have to be separately. And the way that you separate them is in the AB connection, right? As you can see there in the diagram. By the way, I meant to mention uh, earlier, if you guys have questions, uh, make sure and press the Q&A button. And I have a couple of experts sitting offline here that will answer your questions as we move through this. Uh, and then we're going to save a few questions for the end uh, to do live. So uh, if you want to ask a question or you, get, you think something pops into your head and think, wait, 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 i got to get straight on that, just go to Q&A and one of my buddies back there will answer the question for you online, okay? Let's see here. So let's talk about some more ring topology. Let's talk about creating shared uh, systems, meaning input sharing and gain tracking, where, right, where we have uh, a pair of engines sharing uh, a set of I.O., right? We don't have dis discrete I.O.s for the engines or the systems. This is a, sh a shared system. Well, the, the console loops work exactly like they had before. Excuse me. Uh, so we're, we're not going to really address that. It's just two independent console loops at each location. So I'm just going to kind of darken that out just to make this description a little easier to follow. So obviously those two ABB ports, that, uh, cards that we have at the bottom there, those represent the two engines now. So what we have to create is an A to B loop here as well. So you can see I go from the A port of one engine up to the B of the stage rack and then loop it on back. But instead of returning to that engine, I return it to the second engine, right? So the output of the last device goes back to the, the second engine there. And then we need to create a connection between the A and B port of the two engines. And as you can see there, now we have a complete loop completed there, a complete redundant loop. We can lose any one connection there and still be operating once it's been established, okay? All right, so I hope that's clear, clears that up for you guys. That can be confusing for people at times I've seen uh, where you can, you know, people think just, ooh, how do I get these two systems to interconnect? It's really just the key is to treat them as two separate network loops, your console loops, and then your stage rack loops, and it, then it becomes pretty easy to track it down and, and do it. All right, let's see what we got next. Um, well, you know, as I think I mentioned in a previous uh, webinar, we are now supporting Starpoint connection uh, to with our systems, and this is really exciting because this is really, as this develops over time, this is really going to expand the capabilities of S6L systems and what we can do with these systems. As it sits right now, we've, uh, we've already qualified the Luminex AVB switches. And what's that, what that is going to allow us to do is get rid of this kind of ring topology where we have to create this huge loop and get back and forth, right? In this situation, you could have centrally located switches and literally just cable out to the switch. You don't have to worry about creating a loop. And this becomes really handy in places like, you know, performing arts centers, even in concert sound, large scale concert sound, where you have quite a bit of distance uh, between systems. Uh, you can, you know, you can get lost easily with it if you don't have really good labeling schemes for your cables, etc. This just really neutralizes that challenge in that it allows you just to star point out to the switch and get everything connected. So in this situation, you see that I have two console loops built 
Uh, these are two systems. This is not a shared system. These are two independent, uh, or I'm sorry, this is a shared system. Two independent systems here. And I've just taken the A ports out of all devices to the switch, right? So this would be our primary um, connection in StarPoint. So all the A ports go to, to the common switch. Now, if we want to create redundancy with this, we just add a second switch and attach it to all of the B ports, right? So there's our primary switch with all the A port connection. Here's our B switch with all the B switch connections. And then if we want to add a second system for gain sharing, it's just a matter of duplicating that into the switch, A connections and B connections. And you know what we fully expect to be able to do is to be able to add more systems to this and qualify you know, it, it, we're in the qualify, qualification process now, but three, four, five, six systems being able to add it in StarPoint and have it work just fine. <laughs> now, I will point out at this point in, the, in our software development, we only support a certain amount of devices attached, whether you're in StarPoint or in Ring. We hope that will change over time, too. We're developing toward that as well. Uh, but it's, it, it, we need to give that consideration at, the, at this point because there's two things in play. Currently, the switch could handle more devices, but our software doesn't allow you to actually add those devices in, in the SXL kind of unified platform scheme yet, the additional devices, I should say. So we only support certain combinations right now, but that, that will change over time, I'm confident. All right, so let's uh, stop, take a breath right there and just talk about the AVB cable specs, because this is an important piece of it to get this connected properly. You really want to pay attention to your cable quality and your cable lengths here. It absolutely matters in these networked systems. So I would say to you, please pay attention to these when you're designing these systems and meet this spec if you expect the kind of performance that we know that these systems can do. So for a copper, it's shielded Cat5e, 350 megahertz or better, up to 100 meters, right? 330 feet. And the second piece of that is you need to have the Neutric uh, Ethercon connection there in place to meet the spec, all right? It is an important piece of it. So guys, I encourage you to do it. I know it's tempting just to plug in that Cat5 there and go, and you may get lucky, lightning may strike, and it may work just fine. But if you, you, you pay attention to these specs when you're making these Cat5 connections, you have a much, much better chance of consistent, you know, non-troublemaking connection, okay? Let's talk about fiber optic for a minute. We have a couple of different modes that we can use in fiber optic. You can do single mode fiber, uh, 9 over 125, OS1 or OS2. Uh, you can, it, this is a duplex LC connection, so you have the, the two connector uh, deal. So two single mode SFP transceivers required for that. Uh, supports connections up to 6.2 miles away. So you can do some extreme connection links in AVB with single mode fiber. In terms of multi-mode fiber, the, uh, the spec drops down a little bit. We go down to 500 meters or 1,650 feet, but really that, that still fits into a lot of workflows. There's not too many workflows that that could not address, okay? So pay attention to these specs. You'll have a great time with ABB, I promise you. All right, so here's kind of what I wanted to address in terms of just the, the number of devices that you can connect and the combinations of devices that you can connect uh, this is kind of what we support right now, and there's even a couple more uh, that we that we would support here, I think. I'll, I'll go through these, and I, I might be wrong there, but I'll take a look. <clears throat> but in the ring topology, uh, you have to pay attention to the number of nodes, the number of devices that are in the ring. And right now, we support up to seven nodes in the ring, okay? And that is part of the ABB spec. So as you can see in that first example there on the left with five nodes, that's four stage 16s connected to the engine. So that would be four stage 16s and the engine would create five nodes. Uh, likewise, as you see there with two stage 32s and four stage 16s, that's a seven node connection. Uh, even though that would give you, what is that, 64, 128 inputs there, you, you know, the capacity for AVB is higher in terms of input count, but we, ex you know, we would exceed the node count there. So we can't get that high with that, that uh, by just adding another rack there. So you can kind of see how it works here, right? Same thing in five, you know, like if we go down to where it says five nodes with two stage 64s and two stage 32s, well, okay, that gets us to the 192 input limit, but we're only at five nodes. What if we wanted to add another stage 32 to do some more distributed I.O.? Right now, currently, this date today, the software does not support that third uh, 
stage 32. We hope to do that in the future, uh, in the pretty near future. So uh, hopefully we'll have a much more flexible, much more nimble uh, I.O. connection scheme available to you. We hope to get it to the point where you can connect any combination of I.O. devices, okay? Now, if you wanted to really expand uh, your I.O., there is the, the, the concept is there to add a third ABB card. That is currently not supported in software, but you notice we have the slots. That option is available to us. That is something we are looking into most definitely to be able to do uh, multiple I.O. rings and have them addressable by the software. All right, so I would say just hang in there with us on that. Uh, we're gonna, we hope to develop toward that at some point in the future. Okay, let's see here. All right, let's move to Maddie connection schemes. This is always exciting. All right, so we have some built-in MADI on the system. On the Stage 64 and the Stage 32, you have built-in MADI splits already available to you there. This is just a direct split of the digitally converted mic pre that is gonna go down a multi-channel MADI stream, right? So, uh, and you know, we pay attention to the AES spec for, uh, for MADI here in, in standard mode, which is 96 kilohertz uh, for venue you would get two 32 channel spigots of MADI out of that stage rack. So you would have two 32 channel streams of 96K MADI. On the stage rack or within the software itself, you can, you can do SRC at the stage rack level, meaning you could convert that to 48K if you wanna do it. And on the stage 64, that turns into two spigots of 64 channels each at 48K. Now again, these are just direct taps off of the Stage racks, these are fantastic for doing MADI records, going out to another MADI console. If you wanted to attach to another console, you could certainly do that here. Even if you needed to change sample rate to a, uh, a lower sample rate console, you could certainly connect that console to it and it would receive all of these, this mic pre information there as well. On the stage 32, there's only one spigot, so it's either gonna be 32 channels at 96K or 32 channels at 48K, all right? So if you had multiple 30, uh, 32 stage rack 32s, you might need to combine those down into a single stream. There are plenty of devices out there to do that, to do that uh, MADI collation, uh, to get all those down to one stream if you wanted to do it. But you know, you, you're still gonna be subject to the, uh, the AES spec of 64 channels in a 48K stream or 32 channels in a 96 kilohertz stream, okay? All right, let's see what else. Yeah, we also have the ability to add a MADI card, a high density MADI card to the engine if we wanna do that. And the slots are there to do it. You can add up to four of these MADI cards to get a very high channel count if you wanna do it in, a, in an E6L192 or an E6L144. Uh, it supports up to 256 channels back and forth at 96K. Now, there is no SRC available uh, to that MADI card in the engine, it has to operate at 96K. So if you need to get this out to other sources that are 48K or whatever other sample rate you want, you will need to sample rate convert it to get it to the, 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 those other devices, all right? Now, another piece of this that I wanna kinda alert you to, just, uh, you know, people have run into this challenge in the past and it is a function of our MADI card. If you have asynchronous streams returning back to this engine, on these MADI on these MADI cards, meaning from two different sources or you know not synchronized, it's important to understand this MADI card will not resynchronize those streams. Okay, you need to put a device in between the output of those other MADI devices into this MADI card. We we recommend the Diotech uh, M1K2. It is just absolutely stellar at this. Uh, if you need to resynchronize those asynchronous streams, put this device in between S6L and the sending device and you are off to the races. It will work just absolutely fine. Totally stable, noise-free, okay? All right, uh, this is one I wanna bring your attention to because this is actually in the manual and I'm gonna give you an alternative to this, a couple of alternatives to this. But again, this has to do with that uh, lack of the card's ability to resynchronize, okay? So in, in the manual, we actually have this in there where you could create 64 tie lines between two standalone S6L systems using MADI. I mean, it seems logical that you would be able to do this. In this situation, we have a word clock output going from uh, the, uh, the primary, uh, I don't even call it the primary, just, just one of the engines uh, to the second engine. So the MADI that is traveling from that engine to the second engine will work fine. 
but we have seen instances where the MADI that is returning from the second engine to the primary engine can get out of sync. It can be a function of cable length, it can be a function of cable quality, any, any number of factors can impact that, and because the card does not have the, the ability to resync, it, it just will not pass audio coming back. So we have seen this happen, uh, but we do have workarounds for it if you are dead set on doing this with MADI. Now, I'll, I'll bait the hook here a little bit and say, I'm going to give you some other options to create these kind of tie lines a little later in this presentation. So don't get hung up on thinking we can't do this. We can, but I actually think the network, uh, uh, the way of doing this with network is actually more, uh, a better idea. It's a better workflow for most of the workflows that we deal with. All right, so also important to understand that this does, is not supported. This uh, scenario you see right here is not supported for input track or input shared and gain tracked systems. All right, this is two standalone systems there. All right, so uh, if we want to do this though, if we are dead set on being able to do this, what you need to do is use distributed word clock, right? You need a house sync here, so to speak, uh, where we have an external word clock that is gonna distribute word clock to both of those engines. And once you do this, then this works fine, you know, where you can create these 64 send and returns from each system there, all right? It's worth pointing out here that the word clock, which we'll, again, we'll cover again in just a second here, the word clock out on the MADI card does not function. It is not supported currently in any version of S6L. So don't use the MADI card as a word clock outsource. There are other places to do it that are much more suited to do it. But just be aware, the, the word clock output, uh, output port on the MADI card is not supported, okay? All right, let's see, where do we go from here? Yeah, let's, well, this is the perfect time. Let's jump right into word clock. Now, you know, all the mysteries of word clock, and I'll try to demystify this for you for S6L. Uh, in this situation, let's just put down some rules, okay? Here's, here's a few of the rules for word clock connection with S6L. One, and this is kind of true for all devices, not just SXL, but you don't want to daisy chain word clock among multiple devices, right? And by daisy chain, I mean go from word clock out to word clock in of one device, word clock out of that device to another device, and right on down the line. It just, you, it just simply does not work that way. That is not the way word clock was meant to work. So please don't do it on our systems either. It will, it will not be supported. Uh, currently, there is word clock connection on the Stage 64s. It is not supported either. So, uh, you know, it just will not work. We do not have it turned on. It does not, uh, does not function. Now, that said, if you need a word clock connection, a word clock out connection uh, at your stage rack location, one of the ways you can get it that is valid is to put a DSI card into that stage rack that has a word clock output on it. That will be supported. It is turned on. And I believe you can do multiple sample rates off of that word clock output there. Uh, so that is one way to get word clock output at your remote locations around your stage if you want to do it. And again, just as I mentioned earlier, the word clock output on the MADI 192 option card is not supported in software or hardware. All right, so it does it is labeled word clock output, no connection there, so don't count on it, okay? Uh, in shared systems, uh, the main thing to remember, this is the piece of uh, kind of gold to remember in a shared system, regardless of how many systems are on there. Once you integrate those two engines, once you make that connection between the two engines, that is considered one complete system now. And, you know, just as a general rule in word clock, you're only going to have external word clock enter a system at one place, right? Then it's going to be, become a slave to that external clock. So you wouldn't take word clock to each one of the engines in a shared system. That's a no-no. Uh, then, then you've got co clock conflict happening there. It's not sure what's happening there, which one of those uh, is the proper word clock. So again, if you're in an uh, input shared and gain track system, clock entry at one place. I don't, think it, I don't believe it matters which engine it goes to in terms of word clock input, but you would not want to do it to both, okay? All right, so let's just kind of go through that in graphic form now. So here is a, an E6L engine that you see, and the external device connected is at 96K only, uh, and we are going uh, from an external word clock device providing clock to the engine. So you see the word clock out from the external device. This could be a console. This could be anything that you want it to be. It could be clock distribution, but it would enter the S6L system at the engine at the word clock input. 
And then finally, uh, or not finally, but carrying on here, this is another uh, instance of the shared. And as you can see here, what it, this just reinforces what I was uh, previously saying. Uh, the entire system is considered a single system, so you really only want to have word clock input entering at one engine port here. So just word clock in on the engine. Uh, another important piece to this also, whoops, I think I, I don't think I have it labeled here, but I'll, I'll point it out. For this to work in a shared system, you must complete the loop. It has to have a, a complete loop all the way around for the, the word clock to transfer to both systems. All right, so just keep that in mind. You can't have uh, this in a non-complete loop and actually have it work. So make sure you understand that. And then, of course, for distributed, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you could have a word clock device that it does a synchronized distributed output that would go to multiple receivers, multiple word clock inputs, and I'll be okay here. This is totally legal to do, regardless of whether you're on a single system, multiple discrete systems, or an input shared and gain track system, okay? And then let's talk about some word clock out, uh, <laughs> word out clock schemes. <laughs> I'll fix my own PowerPoint there. Nice. Uh, you know, you always find one error when you do the actual run through. <laughs> it never fails. So in this situation, you're going to take word clock output from the E6L uh, engine into the external device. Now, remember, like I said, we don't want to daisy chain here in any way, shape, or form. So if that, if you're going to use the E6L or the S6L system as the master clock to clock multiple devices external to the system, then this would want to go out to a clock distribution, right, where E6L is, or, or uh, excuse me, S6L system is the master and then the distribution is going to distribute clock to the other devices, right? Uh, that's totally legal to do as well. Uh, so, but just keep in mind, you don't want a daisy chain here by any stretch of the imagination if you need to get to more external devices. Uh, here's an example of that stage rack that I was talking about where we don't support the actual clock connections on the master board of the stage 64, but we can put a DSI 192, uh, yeah, 192 card in there uh, and actually have the word clock out from that go to our external devices. And same principle applies. No daisy chaining. If you need that word clock out to go to clock distribution, that's legal to do from this point uh, as well. This is also applicable to stage 32 because remember they use common blades, common input and output cards. So you would just flip that card over 90 degrees, put it in a stage 32 and use it as a stage or, or as a clock output source there as well. Okay. All right, so let's take a look here. Yeah, at word clock out schemes for the shared systems here, and it's word out clock <laughs> schemes. I'm going to start my own new term here, word out clock. Uh, so <laughs> we've got the shared system here, and as you can see in this situation, because the SXL is the, the master here, then you can actually use that as a second word clock out in the shared scheme. That's one system. It's just multiple outputs of the same clock at that point. So this is okay. This is a, uh, a supported scenario. Uh, obviously, you want to have the redundant loop must be complete here again. You know, this is in a looped system. Uh, I, I, I'll be frank with you. I haven't taken the time to explore all of the word clock scenarios for a star point system yet. That is on my list of to do's. Uh, maybe in our next go round of this, I'll have all the diagrams for that as well. If you have questions on clocking schemes in StarPoint, I just encourage you to reach out to an AVID specialist and we'll walk you through what, what the likely scenario would be on it, okay? All right, let's jump into some alternate network uh, connection schemes. These are kind of fun to deal with. And honestly, you know, the more I talk about these with people, I'm, I'm surprised how many people don't really realize you can do this kind of stuff with S6L. So this is gonna be kind of fun to do. Let's look at this. So the first is using our, our low density Dante card that goes in a stage rack uh, to just create an additional Dante network to your system, right? So you could just put a, uh, a Dante card in one of our stage racks, connect it up to a Dante switch, use a uh, laptop or computer run, running Dante controller and connect multiple devices. Now you have pathways from an S6L system to any of these other devices uh, if you want to do it, right? Now, kind of the amount of inputs and outputs you have for that Dante card depend on what slot, slots it's in 
in the stage 64. So right now that card is spanning an input slot and an output slot. It takes up two slots to be able to do this because it's a 16 channel card. So as you can see here, it's kind of spanning the input and the output. So that would create eight sends and returns to the Dante network. That would be eight talkers, eight listeners, right? But depending on where we put the card, we can make it a, a different combination. We could make it uh, 16 talkers if we put it in two output slots. And likewise, we could make it 16 listeners if we put it in 16, uh, over 16 input uh, channels, right? Over two input slots. So it just depends on how you configure the card in terms of how many channels you get to it. And of course, we could we support multiple cards. So you could have multiple cards in there and create multiple, ch multiple channel connection capabilities uh, to that Dante network, right? So uh, with this in mind, you know, I'll, you start thinking about all kinds of possibilities here. And this is a good, I mean, I think a really solid alternative to doing MADI tie lines. I think this is a much better way to do tie lines between two systems, right? So uh, the beauty of this is you, this can work in shared or in standalone systems. There's not a problem with any of the clocking issues or any of that by doing this. So if you have, if this was two discrete systems here where you had one system using the stage 64, one system using the 32, we just connect their Dante cards to the network and now we have eight sends and returns for talkbacks, playbacks, whatever you do that are shared on this network now, right? It's not just shared between the two systems, but it's also shared to the other Dante devices uh, that are on that network. And this operates, you know, essentially autonomously from the ABB network, right? This works just fantastic. Uh, so you would just make those connections in the, the Dante controller and you are off to the races. And again, just to reemphasize, this works in a shared system as well, where the master console in the system would claim the one Dante card, the other system would claim the second Dante card, and then you're gonna have eight sends and returns back and forth to those systems, right? Uh, it works out just fantastic. All right, let's see what else we got here. Yeah, so let's talk about high density uh, network workflows. Now we, we don't really offer much yet in terms of what we can do here, uh, but I wanna pull your attention to the slots and I want us to kind of think about what could happen uh, in the future once we develop these cards to be able to do this, right? So right now we've developed a high density uh, network card for wave sound grid, uh, where we can actually ta attach a wave sound grid server with a simple Cat5 connection and have it be a lot of channels back and forth, right? We could even connect up two uh, servers here and use them automatically redundantly, meaning there's automatic rollover between the servers, you know, only one set of licenses required, et cetera. But you can create a really powerful wave sound grid network with just this card in the engine. As you notice, there are more slots there available to it. So as we develop more cards, maybe for things like, uh, you know, a high density Dante network or a high density AVB network like Milan or something like that, as those things develop over time, this is where those cards would connect. And very much like we did with the low density Dante, you're just gonna create attached networks to the S6L system. Really, really powerful, really expansive once you get going here. It's really a great way to work. Uh, let's see, where do we go from here? Oh, we're gonna jump to our old dear friend, the ECX port on S6L. So uh, at, for you guys that are familiar with legacy venue systems, the ECX port has been with us for a long time and we've carried it right on over into SXL. It has very specific things we can use it for now. Uh, again, very powerful, really cool stuff. So uh, just for example, we, if we connected this to a wireless router, right, we would have the option to do a lot of things in this ECX port. We could uh, attach a network, a, a computer to it where we could use something as simple as a VNC browser built into Safari, meaning you would just type in v, VNC uh, semicolon backslash backslash IP address, put in the IP address of the console, and you are in remote control of the console right there in the browser, right? You can take remote control of it there. Uh, so you, this can be a great way to have remote look into the console, all kinds of things like that, that is just done back through this VNC port. We, get, we also use this VNC port for immersive DSP controllers, things like uh, Elisa, DMB Soundscape, Flux, all of those things. And once we have those connected to the ECX port, we can have plugins that are running on the console that are in remote control of that immersive DSP, right? We can actually have all the tactile control for that immersive DSP on the console itself. 
very, very powerful. That takes place back through this CCX port. And then finally, wirelessly, we have a lot of options to us uh, for iPad and even iPhone. Any iOS device uh, is supported to do this. Uh, these are free apps on the Apple Store. You can go get them. We have a remote mixing app uh, that is great. This is kind of this was meant as kind of a replacement for our PQ system. If you remember that in the past, it is full duplex remote control of any mix on the console. So if you were an artist and you had your phone or your iPod, iPad at your station, you could take control of a mix that is sitting on S6L. The beauty of it being those mixes follow snapshots. Any changes you make, the engineer makes, or our engineer sees, any changes the engineer sees, you see at the remote station. It's just a fantastic way uh, to do remote mixing. And we support up to 16 iPads on that ECX connection to be able to take remote control of 16 different mixes if you want to do it. It's really a great uh, little product to do this. And the best part about it audio-wise is that you're going to use the all of the audio I.O. options to get audio either to your ears or to your monitors, whatever you're using, really high quality audio with the system as well. In addition to that, we have a uh, another application that allows you to take control of all the function switches on the console through the same thing. It's a, it's a function pad app uh, that runs on the, uh, on the iPad or the iPhone. Again, once you start using this thing, I, I mean, I'm just so in love with this app. I use this just all over the place. It is so powerful to be able to, to custom design, you know, buttons on an iPad and be able to take over uh, console function in this way. So uh, it's just great to be able to do this on here. And this all works wirelessly across Wi-Fi into that Wi-Fi router. Okay. All right. Well, I, if that's not enough for you, uh, you it's going to take two webinars to get another one in here. So I hope this was, uh, I hope this was helpful to you. I hope it kind of demystified uh, a lot of the connection possibilities, because let's face it, guys. I mean, we're in a we're in challenging times now in audio. We have a lot of connection protocols out there that are uh, a bit, you know, our abilities to connect and, and route audio everywhere through all these different protocols. And especially given that they're digital protocols, you know, there's a lot of rules that have to be in place to make it make it function and work pop properly. So uh, we're aware of it. We're trying to keep you up to date on it. Uh, try to make it less confusing for you. All right. So with that in mind, we will move to the Q&A section here. And I will open it up to uh, Dirk here. Let's see, Dirk's got a question. Let's see, it looks like it's from Winston. Oh, Winston, you made it, man, good to see it. I got your email, I, I hope, you, hope you got in okay. So I'll just read off Winston's question here. With the Dante connections, could you connect a Yamaha console to the Avid IO rack? Uh, you could uh, you could certainly port to it uh, if you it's going to be if you can get it to 48k. Uh, you know that's a, actually a really good question. I'm going to maybe pull Mike Zimba in on that. Let's see. I got to think about that here. Mike, can we combine uh, 48k and 96k uh, connections in that low density Dante network? Do you know that? I think we can do that. Yeah, from the... I'm pretty sure you can. Yeah, I, I haven't done that, but I'm I'm 99% sure I have interconnected 48k devices into my S6L system through that. You know, so yeah, you should be able to do that, Winston. Are you thinking about? I, I mean, obviously it's low density. Maybe I'll, I'll try to ask you a return question here, guys. If you can pull his answer, that'd be fine. Uh, uh, are you looking to get complete channel counts over to, to a second console or just sp specific inputs and outputs? I mean, maybe I can answer the question for you if you're going to answer it. It is only specific inputs and outputs. It's not, that's not a split necessarily of the mic pre's there. You're going to have to use up uh, processing channels to direct audio into those pathways on the Dante network there. Okay. Um, maybe I'll see you. Maybe we can, bring, we can talk about that on Thursday if you want. So, uh, can two consoles uh, connect via MADI? Okay, so uh, can two consoles, S6L and SC48, connect via MADI? Uh, I would say under some very strict circumstances, you could do this. Now, it would be a situation where you could take MADI output from a 48K, uh, 48K output from a stage rack 
into the MADI input of the state, what it was, SC, actually, I don't think SC48 has MADI. So I'm going to stop there with that. Don't believe Ma uh, SC48 has MADI. But if you had a legacy venue system that had MADI cards in it, you would probably be able to do that. I got a feeling, if I remember right, on um, legacy venues, it requires a word clock connection as well, though, because, it again, that, that MADI card in the legacy systems did not have a clock input to resync it. So you would, there would definitely be need to be a word clock connection between those two systems. So you definitely want to experiment with that, make sure it's going to work in that scenario. But you do have 48K outputs on the stage rack. So I would say I'll, I'll, here's the best I'll go to you. Theoretically, yeah, you should be able to do that. Uh, so test it out. But SC48 does not have MADI, so I, you wouldn't be able to do it there. Any more questions there, fellas? Okay, yeah, here we go. Uh, if you take, uh, you're, you're asking what the, or sorry, I'll just repeat the question again. I'm sorry, I think you guys can see these questions. Maybe you can. What type of fiber connection can both multi-mode and single-mode fiber be used? What are the max links on multi-mode and single-mode fiber? Uh, you know, that's actually a great question. I, I posted the max links in there. So if you go back through this uh, webinar, you will be able to see the maximum lengths for both of those. I think for single mode, it was just over six miles. And for multi-mode, it was about 1,600 feet. I might have that backwards. Forgive me. My brain's a little a little smoky at the moment. But you just go back through the presentation here, and we can find it. Maybe, as a matter of fact, maybe I can go back through it here. We'll get back to it. Uh, Mike, maybe you can answer the question of combining multi-mode and single-mode. I'm not under the impression that we can do that. Do you think we can do that? I know not, you could. Not on the same connection, but you could right. run multi-mode from one unit and, and out single-mode. Right. So you could do, um, let me get back to that slide here. One momento. There, oops, there it was, sorry. Right, so single mode is the six mile. So if I, if I understood you right, Mike, uh, you could do the uh, single mode for your long haul and then use multi-mode between devices at the destination. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So similar... Um, Similar response there, right, to our combining Cat5 and Fiber. It's going to be a similar uh, connection scheme there where you're using that long haul to get there and then the, the short haul for interconnection and then long haul back. Okay, so hopefully that answers your question there. Uh, in using ECX Remote on laptop, is there already a dedicated step-by-step -step video to connect Mac OS uh, I don't know that there's a dedicated video to it, but honestly, it... I, it really could not be much simpler. Uh, it, yeah, I'll give you just some basic ground rules for it. You have to use a router that can distribute DHCP uh, or a fixed address. You have to have sharing on, on the Macintosh. Once you do that, if you open up a, a Safari browser and type in VNC, I think it's semicolon, backslash, backslash, 192.168. Blah, 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 whatever the address is on venue, it should pull up the venue screen. And you'll see not only the typical venue software screen, but you'll also see the universe view there as well. I use it all the time. If you're in on any of my labs uh, on the Mondays, et cetera, and you see my venue screen on there, that is the Safari VNC browser that you're looking at right there. So it is definitely possible. Pretty easy to do. Ooh, okay, here's one. Is there a Luminex switch with enough SC SFP ports to allow a completely fiber Starpoint configuration with I.O. sharing? Uh, I only see four or six in the pictured switch. I, 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 I hate to do this to you. I'm just going to have a, have to punt you over to the Luminex guys for that one. That That is still pretty new to us. We, we are just recently online with those, and I, I'm not fully up to speed on their entire product line and its capabilities there. So I don't know that you could do it entirely on fiber there if there's enough ports to do that. 
I, I'll, I'll tell you something. Those those Luminex guys though are very sharp, and their products are just fantastically built products. So I would be surprised if they didn't have the ability to do multiple fiber SFPs there. Uh, so check in with them. Go to luminex.com and check in with them and see if they can do that for you. I would bet you, I I'm going to just gamble a little bit and say there's probably a good chance. Okay. Uh, let's see. Luminex Gigacore two. Yeah, bigger. Your state uh, looks like you're stating that the bigger model is Luminex Gigacore two twenty six i. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. All right. So let's see. Does the VNC connection mirror the touchscreen, or can two people work independently? No, two people cannot work independently. There, that is a complete mirror of the software. So anything you do remotely, the local user will see that happen. As a matter of fact, you will disrupt his workflow if you do it. Okay, so yes, th those are not independent workflows. Do you need flipped ether? I'm assuming you mean like a, uh, what do they call that? A null cable on for AVB? And the answer is no, just standard uh, network cabling will work there in terms of that protocol. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, the Dante card to in the Avid Stage Racks have SRC. Uh, I'm sorry, you're asking, do the Dante cards in the Avid Stage Rack have SRC? If the answer is yes, you can connect to the uh, CL or QL. I, I, I don't know is the honest answer. Matter of fact, maybe I, I have a Dante card here. Maybe I can go look real quick. Hang on one second. Let me just get into my devices and I'll see if it shows up as that ability. Yeah, I don't think we have the ability to alter that um, that sample rate on our Dante card to 96K or to 48K. Do not quote me on it. I may do a little research on that because that's a fantastic question. That actually might answer some questions for me, but I don't see the ability to do it here. You may be able to do it in the Dante Control Manager. You might be able to facilitate there, but I, I don't know for sure. All right, it looks like that is the end of the Q&A. Thank you for some great questions today. Very engaged audience there. You guys were super today. I wish I had more absolute answers for you. Uh, you know, if I'll, I'll just put it this way. If you guys want to reach out to me, you know how to get in touch with me on uh, through robertscoville.com or any of that. You know, I'll, I'll be glad to kind of dig in on some of these and answer them for you if you want uh, and get back to you by email if, you, if you're really hurting for information. But I would encourage you to you know, check out our uh, our K-Base, our knowledge bases on the AVID website. They are chock full of this information. Get those SS SXL guides for all the most recent softwares, and they will probably answer that question in there in, to some degree. But if you're really hurting for that answer, reach out to me, and I'll do a little research and get it sorted for you, okay? It'll be good for me. I'll learn something as well. All right, so on that note, we will pull the ripcord here at right at 55 minutes. And I say thank you to everybody for showing up on this. Make sure and look for the replay if you want to review any of this on, uh, on the YouTube sites or on the Avid website. If you go to the Avid websites uh, for Live Sound webinars, they will be posted there along with all of the other uh, Live Sound webinars as well. So thank you very much for showing up today, guys and gals. I will see you in a few weeks for the next Avid Live Sound webinar. We'll see you. Take care. Bye-bye.